first prepared a sort of account of the history of North Fitzroy many years ago through the North Fitzroy Conservation Study, and I had thought that I would use that as the starting point today. Unfortunately, the last issue of the Society's newsletter came out, the one with, I think it's Brad Pitt on the cover, um, and was a, inside a much more learned history of North Fitzroy, written anonymously. Um, I thought it might be by Simon Sharma from the style of it, but it really meant that my thunder has been stolen, and I'm going to be slightly more subjective and eccentric in trying to avoid covering exactly the same ground that you already have in your, in your newsletter. I would invite you to stop me criticise, correct, or ask questions as I go, rather than wait till the end. It's more interesting, I think, to do that. But as it has asked, if you do, because this is being recorded for international television, um, that you give your name and you talk loudly and clearly so that it will come out in the, in the recording. So do stop me if you wish to. Um, I suppose, as I said, I would be subjective. When Mary and I first moved into South Fitzroy, in, I think it was 1977, we were very conscious of this division between the North and the South. Near us we had the Builders' Arms, which is a favourite haunt of criminals. We could hear from our front bedroom window the sounds of people fighting and wailing and beating on doors at night. The drugs came in mainly a bit later. We knew that up in the North, rich people lived in grand terraces ranged, ranged along wide streets with trees and nature strips. And it seemed to be pretty much, not so much part of Fitzroy, but part of Carlton and Clifton Hill, all that sort of gracious strip up to the north, not really a part of Fitzroy proper at all. That was really, though, a, a misconception. Uh, even our own house, which was a horrible uh, renovation done in the 1950s by a Macedonian migrant, had its own links with North Fitzroy. Underneath that facade, the cottage behind was built in the, 18, in the 1860s and was the home of the pioneer builder John Faulkner. Faulkner is known for having built the adjoining uh, Faulkner Terrace uh, and a number of other houses in Napier Street um, using his own land as his own speculation. And he also built, of course, much of North Troy. And Faulkner Street, North Troy, uh, is named after him. Um, which are his own houses, I haven't researched, and I don't know which ones he built, but he was certainly a big builder in North Troy. And apart from that connection with our house, I had had an earlier involvement, and I'll explain what that was a little later, um, in relation to what I regard as the heart of North Fitzroy, this area here. And I think there may be some people here who won't know where it is. Because it's so hard to get to, we've tried last weekend to drive in here with the one-way streets, that it's not often a place you just pass through. But why it's the heart of North Fitzroy, I will proceed to, to explain. But I need to go back to the beginning to do that. Um, in relation to the suburbs of Melbourne generally. In 1837, the surveyor Robert Hoddle established the Town Reserve of Melbourne, as indicated on that drawing. Um, and to understand it, to realise that north is see the north part of the angle, um, the, the line across the top there is actually the line of Victoria Street. What Hoddle has done is to locate Melbourne more or less parallel with the river, not on a north, south, east, west orientation. And so the line of Victoria Street the planning after that begins to revert to north, south, east, west. And that's why when you travel out of the city today, the trams go out of Bend, Elizabeth Street and Saunter Street as they pass across Victoria Street. Um, and the idea was that this was the town reserve where the town had a group to expand, and outside was the suburban land which would be subdivided on a large scale grid. And the town reserve was um, roughly one mile deep. This was a common colonial practice in the settlements, one mile by three miles. Um, and so the average height to the river was one mile, if you measure the one mile from the top of Batman's Hill, which is the side of the Spencer Street Station. And across this side, the boundary of three miles is Hobby Street, Hunt Road, and the other side went through the middle of the storm, but it's actually extended to become Boundary Street to the north. That's what Boundary Street meant, it was the boundary of the original town reserve. So that was the focus of all the suburban development from this time on, from 1837. And before the end of that year, Hobble had surveyed right up from the CBD, and that's it. We're looking at there, the centre of town reserve there, the city there, of course the arrow goes right down that way. And you can see how far he got up in those one square mile grids, um, up to uh, 18 miles north of the CBD, just in the first year of activity. He had been told to survey um, parishes, each one of 25 square miles, so it would have 25 of these squares in it, and those heavy lines 
of the parishes. Each of the parishes would have its own reserve in it. So just as we have this large town reserve here, those shaded ones are a half by one mile uh, reserve for each of the parishes. You have its own village potentially within it. And the parish is divided as they in square sections, except where there's a water frontage mainly. Uh, and there there's a great demand for water frontage, both for washing gardens and stockings so on, and for access before roads go through. So close to the river, you'll see out uh, here, within the one mile grid, there are much smaller divisions. Uh, in fact, over time, they were having surveyed this first, they had some salt straight away, and they suddenly made even smaller, so they realised the pressure to put the development near the heart of the, of the city. And some important groups were already established coming out of town. Coming out of Melbourne, there's one which goes along uh, the top of Common Street, along Smith Street, and then out and becomes the heart of the road. One of the earliest routes out of, uh, out of Melbourne. Um, and the land that was sold at first was not so much immediately outside, that was kept back for obvious reasons, which you get to need things like the cemetery, the hay market, cattle market, and so on. And they actually began selling. Uh, this right hand side, south from Troy and across, and from Brunswick upwards, from Brunswick Road, uh, northward. And that's why it was possible later on to reserve things like the parks within that, uh, within that belt. Um, now, also within that belt were a number of quarries. Some were owned by the government, one was owned by the Melbourne Corporation, the city of Melbourne, and there were some private ones leased from the, from the Crown. Um, this perhaps is a slightly clearer plan, but it doesn't show the solid land just adjoining Melbourne. As you can see, that whole area, giant giant parish, which is reserved. Um, and here, coming to detail, you see what is happening in Fitzroy. All the subdivisions later, um, but early on, there was the government stockade on one side of Nicholson Street, which is where the prisoners quarry for the government, and on the other side, I was sometimes referred to as the quarry allotments in what is now what is now North Fitzroy. I perhaps want to explain that the suburbs at this time were not conceived the way suburbs, uh, suburban developments today are sort of carpet of development around Melbourne. They were literally suburban. They were settlements appended to the town, but independent settlements, separate settlements. Today they would be, 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 be called periodes because they are continuous bands of development. Even Richmond was a Quite close in, was a, had a settlement with houses and it had dairy farms and things around the outside. So you'd go from Richmond to Collingwood. It wouldn't be just a continuous uh, strip that you have uh, today. Uh, and so the quarry is one of those things within this band outside the town. There were brickmakers on the Yarra, there were other activities elsewhere. Those quarry lots, so called, um, you can see now on this uh, land start plan. There are these lots here above Church Street. Um, I must say, by the way, I'm rather resentful of the fact, talking to Asia just now, I found all these plans are now online from the PRO. In my day, we had to get expensive copies, I had to make slides from these fading photocopies. Now, apparently, just load them on a computer online, um, which is extremely annoying, really. Anyway, um, <laughs> those um, lots, you see, I've transcribed here the names of the people on them. And they were all sold uh, in 1851, uh, uh, almost without exception. Um, and these are the people where people often assume a quarry, and they often assume there were quarries on those, that site. As we'll see later, there's no indication that any quarries were actually in that area. Um, and in fact, those people are not quarry men. Those are people whose names we, we know. The closest approach to the quarry men were uh, up uh, at the top left, um, were. Um, uh, Gerber and Roberts, they were the contractors who excavated, blasted the east end of Common Street. So they were using quarrying techniques, and maybe they had some quarrying interest. Many of the others were involved in the building trade. Uh, George Annand was a pioneering iron founder in Melbourne. James Lineker, with his brother Abraham, were leading uh, builders. They did the part of Parliament House. G.B. Hales was a timber merchant. The others, though, must have been simply investors buying here on speculation.